Hello everyone! Welcome to Adapting to Eat, Eating to Adapt, Food, Class, and Identity of Nikkei Brazilians in Japan. I'm Annie Waldman, here live from New York City with the Japan Foundation New York's Japanese Studies team. Thank you so much for joining us this Friday evening. Tonight's lecture is part of Illuminating Japanese Studies lecture series with former Japan Foundation fellows. Since the fellowship program began in 1972, there have been more than 1,000 American fellowship recipients. From pre-modern history to pop culture and everything in between, this lecture series will illuminate what exactly Japanese studies can teach us not only about Japan, but about the world. Our speaker tonight is Ms. Nilifa Hillier. Uh, she is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and she was a Japan Foundation Doctoral Fellow in 2020. She currently teaches at the University of Portland as an adjunct professor in the Department of Sociology and Social Work. And our moderator for the following question and answer session is Mr. Eric Funabashi. Um, he is a doctoral candidate in the History Department at the University of Kansas, and he was a Japan Foundation Brazil Doctoral Fellow in 2021. His dissertation investigates the role of domestic cookbooks in shaping and propagating concepts of femininity during the Meiji period in Japan. For more information about our speakers, please check out the description box down below. The lecture will be followed by a live Q&A session, so please drop your questions in the YouTube chat box at any point during the lecture. We ask that you keep the chat clean, friendly, and respectful. Now let's begin the lecture. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Before study, I'd like to thank the organizer of tonight's event, the Japan Foundation New York, for the invitation to speak with you all tonight and to share part of my dissertation work. They have done so much legwork to prepare for tonight, and I sincerely appreciate their help. I'd also like to thank the Japan Foundation's ongoing support of my work and for providing support to scholars working in the field of Japanese studies, including during the COVID-19 pandemic, which brought about many logistical challenges. I was a doctoral research fellow in 2020, and without Japan Foundation's support and flexibility, I would not have been able to conduct my field work during the pandemic year. I'd also like to thank Eric Nabashi for kindly agreeing to moderate tonight's lecture Q&A. Eric is also a former Japan Foundation doctoral fellow who inserted his fellowship in 2021. I'm grateful for our friendship and for the insight Eric has shared with me in the past. And then I'm sure that he will share with us during the Q&A. I look forward to our discussion after the lecture. Today, I'm presenting part of my dissertation research, which investigates Japanese Brazilians living in Japan and specifically their food waste and social class. So please bear in mind that we are going to see some pictures of food and talking about food a lot. So I hope you're not too hungry now. Being an immigrant in the US myself, I'm always interested in the food waste of migrants and specifically how they adapt to food in a host country and to what extent they retain the procuring cooking, and eating practices from their home countries. My interest in food evoked my curiosity. I wanted to know how Japanese Brazilian people adapt to food in Japan, and primarily because, as you may or you may not know, Japanese and Brazilian food are very different. But before we get into the food or the history, let's take a quick look at what this lecture will cover. First, we will learn about who Nikkei Brazilians are, including their diversity from dekasegi to students and professionals. Next, we will examine what Brazilian food is and explore how food practices have changed as migrants went from Brazil to Japan. We will then examine some common changes in food practices after Nikkei Brazilians came to Japan before wrapping up with an explorations of the food ways of working class Nikkei or dekasegi and middle-class Nikkei. Whenever I tell people about my research, they're surprised to hear that there are many Brazilian people living in Japan. 
So I'd like to give you a very brief overview of the transnational history between Japan and Brazil. In the early 20th century, Japan went through a modernization period. While Japan's cities developed, its countryside fell on difficult economic times. Poor Japanese farmers living in the countryside struggled to make a living. Just a couple of decades earlier, in 1888, Brazil's abolition of slavery forced the country to seek alternative sources of cheap labor for their coffee estates. However, the estate owners could not attract willing European migrants because of the exploitative working conditions on the estates. The two economic crises collided, due in large part to the developing relationship between the governments of Brazil and Japan. The two governments worked together to sponsor Japanese farmers in their immigrations to Brazil. And by 1940, more than 200,000 Japanese had made Brazil their new home. From the onset of their arrival in Brazil, Japanese immigrants used food as a primary means maintaining their cultural and culinary identity in a foreign land. Initially, they struggled to adapt because, of course, there were no Japanese groceries or foods available to them in Brazil. As such, the use of foods available to them, such as Brazilian vegetables and beans, to recreate Japanese staples like miso and soy sauce, among others. Eventually, Japanese were able to access some foods from Japan, which led to innovation in business and agriculture. For example, one group of Japanese founded a soy sauce company in Brazil, while others introduced new crops like persimmon and Fuji apples, among others. These innovations influenced Brazilian food scenes and led to the popularity of Japanese food in Brazil. Over time, Japanese immigrants and their descendants, called Nikkei Brazilians, climbed a social ladder in Brazil. Early on, Japanese immigrants worked mostly as farmers in the countryside of Sao Paulo. The descendants later worked in Sao Paulo city center, oftentimes as maize or random art workers. Eventually, second generation Nikkei Brazilians went to colleges and universities in Sao Paulo and elsewhere in Brazil before obtaining middle class and upper middle class jobs. At home, they usually had what scholars called Nikkei food, which is essentially a combination of Japanese and Brazilian food. Early Japanese family meals consisted of double structures of Japanese and Brazilian, which essentially means that both Brazilian and Japanese food staples were present on the table at the same time, or at least within the same day. For example, Nikkei Brazilians might have had both Japanese and Brazilian food staples on the table at one given meal, or they might have had a Japanese-style lunch and a Brazilian-style dinner. Nikkei Brazilians' typical everyday meal consisted of Japanese or Brazilian-style rice, miso soup, feijão, which is savory stewed beans, tsukemono, which is Japanese people's, and some kind of grilled meat. The food variety at the table varied by different factors, such as whether grandparents and grandchildren were present at the table or not. These grandparents likely favoring Japanese foods and grandchildren favoring Brazilian food. In the 1990s, almost a century after the first Japanese immigrants left Japan for Brazil for economic opportunities, Japan experienced a manual labor shortage. In dire need of manual labor, but reluctant to recruit non-ethnically Japanese people to live in the country, the Japanese government targeted the now very large populations of Japanese descendants living in South America, and mainly Nikkei Brazilians and Nikkei Peruvians. The Japanese government devised the immigration laws, granting overseas Japanese descendants and their families the legal right to live and work in Japan. This incentivized Nikkei Brazilians, who themselves were struggling to find opportunities due to economic downturns in Brazil, to quote unquote return to Japan. Rather quickly, Brazilians became the largest non Japanese national population in Japan. As such, 
Scholars in the field of anthropology and sociology have studied Nikkei Brazilians and this unique Devasiri boom since the 1990s. However, in doing so, scholars treated Nikkei Brazilians as a culturally and economically homogeneous group, meaning that they blanketed Nikkei Brazilians as Japanese descendants who are culturally foreign, a mostly working class group comprised of factory workers who came to Japan temporarily and would return to Brazil after accomplishing their financial goals. However, in my research, I found that not all Nikkei Brazilians live in Japan or just the Kaseri, and that they come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, driven by different motivations other than working in factories. During my Japan Foundation dissertation fellowship year, I was able to interview over 60 Nikkei Brazilian people living in Japan, and I asked them detailed questions about their food-related lifestyles. 32 of these Nikkei Brazilians did not live in the areas known for large Brazilian populations. This is because many of them had professional careers or were pursuing higher education in big cities like Tokyo and Osaka. A departure from the homogeneous representation of Nikkei Brazilians in academic literature. These 32 interviewees were graduate students, young professionals, housewives, and people working in skilled labor force like finance, engineering, and the service industry. 12 of these interviewees had professional middle-class careers in Brazil as well. Aside from this group of 32 professional Nikkei Brazilians, 21 interviewees used to be the Kasegi when they first came to Japan, but they either got promoted or changed their career to a different industry. Therefore, they had higher salary jobs. Others married non Dekasegi people, and this new relationship led to new, new social statuses. Lastly, 23 interviewees were children of Dekasegi parents who ultimately earned higher socioeconomic statuses than their parents. These 23 interviewees found skilled labor positions by obtaining education in Japan or Brazil, or through becoming bilingual or trilingual. Because I interviewed these two distinctive groups of Nikkei Brazilians, one of middle and upper middle class Nikkei, and another of working class Dekasei, I will now discuss their food lady lifestyle separately and explore the differences between the two groups. Before that, however, let's take a moment to see what Brazilian food looks like and specifically how Brazilian food changes in different parts of Japan. Here, you see two menu boards of Brazilian restaurants. The one on the left is from a franchise Brazilian restaurant menu in Tokyo, and the one in the middle is the menu of a restaurant in Hamamatsu, a city that is known for a large Nikkei Brazilian presence. Tokyo's restaurant menu is written in English and Japanese. You will notice that the menu on the left, the Tokyo restaurant's menu, offers a plato feito lunch. Plato feito is a Brazilian style plate lunch that comes with meat. Brazilian rice cooked with oil and seasoning and feijão, savory stewed beans. Just like Japanese people expect lunch sets to include a pairing of rice and miso soup, Brazilian people expect rice and feijão to be included as a pair in any plato feito set. However, this Tokyo restaurant's Prado Feito menu does not include Feijong. This is because this particular restaurant caters to Japanese and international clients who might not be familiar with Brazilian food. On the other hand, the middle menu from the restaurant in Hamamatsu does serve the standard Prado Feito set with Feijong. And the typical Brazilian all you can eat style, showing that they cater towards local Brazilians and Japanese. They also sell Brazilian-style bento and some Brazilian snack items called pastel, which is what I would describe as Brazilian-style empanada. Moreover, the middle of Hamamatsu menu is written in Brazilian, Portuguese, and Japanese, but not in English. Clearly, the restaurant in Hamamatsu knows that their clients are mostly local Nikkei Brazilians. Some restaurants and groceries also offer takeout bento options. 
an example of which is shown in the bottom right corner. This particular bento is from a grocery store in Oizumi, another town that is known for a large Nikkei Brazilian population. Brazilian style bento typically comes with rice and a few pieces of meat and is often reasonably priced. For example, this particular bento comes with an egg and pieces of beef, pork, and sausage, so it's a combination bento and only costs two US dollars. Some factories in cities like Oizumi and Hamamatsu have Brazilian bento options because they cater towards the Kaseri workers. However, according to my interview findings, this Brazilian bento became popular for Japanese workers as well. However, Brazilian cuisine includes more than just rice, grilled meat, and beans. In the top right corner of this slide, you can see a small portion of a large feast served at Brazilian style birthday party. The photo features a salad with palmito or hearts of palm, which are staple features for Brazilian salad. It also shows lost chicken and lasagna, which are very popular items for parties and special occasions. Despite a substantial number of Brazilians living in Japan, Brazilian food culture did not become mainstream in the broader Japanese food scene. According to Taberog, a restaurant search engine in Japan that is similar to Yelp in the US, there are 813,000 food establishments in Japan, only 202 of which are Brazilian. In Japan, Brazilian food is generalized as shuhasko, which is Brazilian-style barbecue that became popularized by Japanese restaurant corporations during the 1990s. Around the same time, Dekasegi started coming to Japan. As you can see, there are two categories of Brazilian food in Japan. One of these categories is shuhasko, which is the most commonly understood and expected by the Japanese eaters. Such Brazilian shuhasko restaurants are typically formatted as all you can eat. They generally feature a buffet table for salad and dessert, and a server who comes to the table with meat on a skewer. Patrons request slices of meat, which the server carves and the patron takes with their tongues. This format makes the dining experience unique and interactive. Despite the perceptions of many Japanese customers, shahasko is not the everyday food of Brazilians but it's rather something that Brazilian people cook in weekends. Due to its all-you-can-eat format and interactive environment, shuhasko has become highly popular for large gatherings and special occasions in Japan. On the other hand, the Brazilian food that my interviewees refer to when speaking about their lives in Brazil is typically no frills and is understated when compared with shuhasko. This traditional Brazilian food is typically a combination of grilled meat, feijão, a rice cooked with oil and seasonings, and often accompanied by salad. So as you can see, there's a gap between what is widely commercialized as Brazilian food in Japan and what interviewees ate every day in Brazil. Now, let's dive into how Nikkei Brazilian's food practices changed after they moved to Japan which I will break down into common changes, changes among Dekasegi and changes among middle-class Nikkei Brazilians. Across socioeconomic statuses, many interviewees maintained Nikkei food lifestyles, the double structures of Japanese and Brazilian food. Although how frequently they ate Brazilian food differed by each interviewee, some had Brazilian style meals almost every day, but some others could go without Brazilian food staples like Feijon for months. They also started eating less meat in Japan because of the higher cost of beef and pork compared to Brazil. Although many of my interviewees grew up with Japanese food in Brazil cooked by their grandparents or parents, nearly half of them were surprised by the sweet taste of Japanese food. For example, the common Japanese side dish tamagoyaki or rolled egg omelette is sometimes seasoned with sugar and soy sauce. My interviewees told me that tamagoyaki in Brazil is always salty and they never had sweet tamagoyaki before. So they were surprised by it when they had it for the first time in their bento or somewhere else. 
Some of them struggle with the sweet taste in savory meals because only desserts have sweet taste in Brazil. Finally, most interviewees preferred cooking at home rather than buying prepackaged or ready-made food. It is common in Japan for people to buy bentos and instant food at convenience stores and grocery stores to make their lives easier. However, many interviewees, including those who never cooked in Brazil, develop a habit of cooking at home, mainly to save money regardless of their gender and schedules. Now, let's look at some specific patterns observed among working class Dekasegi interviewees. Dekasegi interviewees often talked about their initial struggles with their food served at work, which derived from the portion difference, different food culture, such as sweet flavors in meals, and the unavailability of Brazilian food. Especially during the early 1990s, before Brazilian foods became more accessible in Japan, these Nikkei Brazilians found that the food provided at work, such as mental and cafeteria foods, were not fitting enough to perform labor intensive work. Many of them were unfamiliar with Japanese style bento, even though some of them grew up eating Japanese food in Brazil. In the extreme case, some Nikkei got sick from malnutrition because they couldn't eat everything in their bento or cafeteria offerings. You can see the quote from John here, a former Dekasegi. He says that it was common for people to lose weight when start working in the factory because they did not like the food offered by their employer. And that he had to go get snack food like sandwiches to fill up his energy at work. This not so great encounter with Japanese food at work led to a lack of socialization with Japanese food. Naturally, when people have a bad experience with a certain cuisine from their first experience with it, they become wary of trying it again. Also, with more Brazilians settling in Japan after the 1990s, it became easier to access Brazilian foods and groceries in Japanese cities with high populations of the Kasebi. Therefore, the Kasegi have more opportunities to eat Brazilian food, whether at restaurants or at their friends' and family's home, because of their work and location. It is also important to remember that some were less motivated to adapt to different food culture in Japan because of their intention to work in Japan only temporarily. And as mentioned earlier, because Nikkei Brazilians typically live near factories, Brazilian food options in these areas were more diverse and affordable. These options included Brazilian bento, Brazilian style pizza, and Brazilian plate lunch style places. As such, the Kasegi interviewees seemed to be better positioned to maintain their Brazilian diets and food-related cultures and rituals because they live in Japan's Brazilian neighborhoods. Amongst the Kasegi, I noticed differences between those who were single and those who were married. Single people said that they often went out to eat Brazilian food with co-workers on weekends. And during weekdays, they ate at home by themselves, either cooking at home or eating canned Brazilian foods that they bought at Brazilian grocery stores. For Mary Dekasegi, Brazilian food was generally cooked at home and eating out was rare reserved for special occasions like birthday parties. Now, I'd like to read a quote from Tony, an interviewee who was a former Dekasegi in Hamamatsu. Tony's quote speaks about the kind of typical Japanese bento ranch seen on this slide, which he received at work and his difficulty adapting to its unfam unfamiliar flavors. While I read Tony's quote, I ask that you try to imagine what it would be like to experience such a radical change in diet upon starting a new job in a new country. Tony says, in Brazil, my family's typical meal had rice, miso soup, real fish, or meat and feijão. Feijão was indispensable with rice. We ate feijão every day. I ate rice with canned feijão in my apartment in Japan at least once or twice in a week. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the energy to walk. Since there were no Brazilian stores at the time, I brought back many cans of feijão from Brazil. At the factory, I could not eat the bento lunch provided by the company. 
which usually contained deep fried seafood or coloquette with side of cabbage. We don't eat raw cabbage as salad in Brazil, so I ate curry or ramen at the factory's cafeteria. People in Brazil, I don't know if it's different now, don't usually eat deep fried fish, shrimp, or coloquette. People usually eat meat every day because meat is cheaper. But when I lived in Hamamatsu for eight years, I started eating Brazilian food mainly. I used to go to Brazilian restaurants twice or three times in a week with my friends. In Tokyo, Brazilian food is more expensive. And if I go, I can't help myself and eat more than I should. So I stopped eating Brazilian food again. Clearly, Tony's experience with Japanese food turned him off from the cuisine altogether, despite the fact that he grew up eating some Japanese foods. The differences in the flavors and options of his work provided Japanese lunches left him favoring canned and store-bought Brazilian foods all of which he had to buy in Brazil and bring with him to Japan due to the lack of access to Joe's foods in Japan at the time. So here's another set of pictures. The one on the left shows cans of Brazilian feijão and other Brazilian foods at the Brazilian grocery shop in Tokyo. At the time he lived in Hamamatsu, Tony could not find these foods locally and instead brought them back from Brazil when he made return trips. While well, these foods are now available in Japan, they are obviously more expensive than these sold in Brazil. And you can see the high prices in the photo. Some cans are nearly 10 US dollars. The menu on the right is found in a Japanese factory town where many Nikkei Brazilians work. So there's a diner style establishment inside a small Brazilian grocery store. And as you can see in the menu, they have more like diner style plate lunch menu and not something like shihasko that's more common in Tokyo. Now, let's move on to middle-class Nikkei Brazilians' food patterns. In so many ways, the diet is different from the Kaseri groups, primarily because they seem to become alienated from Brazilian food due to a couple of key factors. First, Brazilian food in cities is usually limited to shihasko, which, as shown earlier, is not reflective of everyday Brazilian foods, and is also more expensive than the foods the Kaseri can access in smaller restaurants and grocery stores catering to Nikkei Brazilians. And second, middle-class Nikkei Brazilians view these Jihasko restaurants as inauthentic or not nearly Brazilian because they are typically owned by Japanese people or large Japanese companies catering to Japanese customers. As such, these middle-class Nikkei Brazilians feel that they can't get real Brazilian food where they live. As a result, they go to Shihasko-style Brazilian restaurants only occasionally for birthday or special occasions. In addition, some of these interviewees told me that when their Japanese or international friends and colleagues are curious about Brazilian food, they sometimes find themselves on the spot by taking their friends and introducing them to what some Brazilian food is like. Moreover, given their typically higher salaries and the access this brings, middle-class Nikkei Brazilians get to enjoy other international cuisines available in Japan's large cities. Interviewee cited Thai, Vietnamese, and Chinese food among their favorites, some of which are not as common in their hometowns in Brazil. I highlight a few other differences experienced by middle-class Nikkei Brazilians here, which show how they become alienated from Brazilian food. First, in schools or workplaces where they interact with Japanese colleagues or colleagues who are from different countries, middle-class interviewees had more exposure to different cultures and foods by meeting with people from different backgrounds in general. Second, Middle and upper middle class interviewees had less restrictions on how much they could spend on food, which meant they could get food deliveries and they didn't need to cook every meal at home in order to save money. And some of them enjoyed folk cuisines or fine dining in Japan's urban centers. Also, these interviewees expressed some logistical obstacles to living in cities 
specifically when it came to cooking. For example, most of these interviewees lived in apartments, making it harder for them to recreate food lady rituals that they had in Brazil. Here, I'd like to underscore that social capital, which refers to who you know in Japan and who is in their social network, opened up their dietary and dining options and enabled them to develop knowledge about Japanese and other food. Seven out of 13 interviewees who are currently or formerly undergraduate or graduate students described that they were socialized to new genres of food through their Japanese or international student peers. For instance, and this is actually pertains to both the Kasegi and middle class interviewees, interviewees who initially disliked certain Japanese food, but who are in relationships had more opportunities to overcome their dislike of certain foods. For example, one interviewee, Sari, who was a university student in Japan, met her Nikkei Brazilian boyfriend who had been living in Japan longer than her. And she learned the acquired taste of natto, which are fermented soybeans and known for their strong odor. As her boyfriend ate natto regularly and told her he's healthy. They cooked together to try new foods and went to farmer's markets together for their grocery shopping. Here, I'd like to read another quote from one interviewee named Taka, who is a researcher at the University of Tokyo and came to Japan in 2015 as a PhD student. Taka said, as you may know, staple foods in Brazil are rice and beans with meat and salad. So basically it was like that in my family. My father had a high blood pressure, so at home, we used little salt and not so much strong seasoning. So I was more adapted for that kind of low sodium diet. My diet changed a lot when I started the university in Brazil. I started eating more meat at the cafeteria and did a lot of barbecue with my university friends. When I came to Japan in the beginning, I was trying to adapt to the Japanese culture and local food. At the same time, even though I had scholarship, I wanted to save money, so I didn't want to make Brazilian food because it's very expensive. So I wanted to find what's in local grocery store and try to cook what Japanese people eat. I also started exercising more by com commuting to my work by a bicycle every day. So my diet changed and activities made me lose 10 kilograms or 22 pounds in three months. After adapting to that change and earning more money from my part-time job, I decided to change my diet little by little. I started cooking by myself more, and I was more curious about different kinds of diets. So I did my own research about different weight loss methods. I started to focus my diet more on protein, fat, and fibers, and less carbs. And that was my diet until my wife came to Japan. So I did almost two years of that kind of more restricted diet. I was really amazed because back in Brazil, I tried to lose weight and exercise, but my weight didn't change. And I was a little bit overweight. I couldn't lose weight in Brazil, but it was so easy in Japan to change. So I got interested in diets. Of course, exercise too, but changing and learning about food definitely helped. So we are already at the end of this lecture, but hopefully you learned a bit about the different patterns of Nikkei Brazilian's food practices. In summary, I'd like to revisit how the difference in food practices and preferences between two Nikkei groups emerged. First, social capital, which in this case refers to who you know and who you eat with has a, has a tremendous influence on changing interviewees' diet. And most importantly, new social networks that they cultivated in Japan introduced them to different foods and cultures in their everyday life. Second, cultural capital, which includes interviewees' education, Japanese language, or Portuguese language proficiency, as well as their knowledge about food, all affect the deliberate dietary choices of interviewees, just like we saw in Taka's example. As another example, 
Some interviewees told me that they don't go restaurants if they don't have English menus because they don't need Japanese. Others said that they have serious concerns because of their food allergies. So having Japanese proficiency helped the interviewees branch out from their typical, men typical meal patterns. Having higher education was an indicator that some interviewees had an intellectual curiosity when it came to both nutrition and diet. Third, economic capital, which in this case refers to what you can afford to eat, so as well as financial constraints, ultimately discourage some interviewees from going out to eat, and these interviewees typically cook at home instead. Fourth, of course, geographical locations, meaning where Nikkei Brazilians lived in Japan, either increased or limited their access to Brazilian food. Finally, Personal values shaped everyday dietary decisions. Some interviewees decided to eat healthier diets, so they changed their eating habits from Brazil, learning how to cook healthier foods. As previously stated, some interviewees experienced weight loss because they ate best meat in Japan compared to Brazil. Although I could not discuss in the slide for the sake of time, some interviewees became passionate about animal quality after learning about industrialized food production process around the world and caring more about animals, so their interests and values about like animals and health, wellness overpassed the motivation to eat food for pleasure. I think more than anything, I was so surprised to see just how much food and class are related, and specifically, how talking about food can bring about new discoveries about social groups and communities. As stated earlier, so much of the academic literature of Nikkei Brazilian paints the entire Nikkei Brazilian community as Tekasegi. While many are indeed Tekasegi, many have also moved into different socioeconomic positions, which is reflected in their food experiences. Therefore, in addition to these unique discoveries about Nikkei Brazilian's nuanced food base, we can also now say that Nikkei Brazilian's are much more nuanced of group than earlier academic studies have shown. With that, I thank you all for your time and attention, and I look forward to engaging with you in a Q&A session with Eric. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Lumika, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, to start our uh, short discussion, uh, I would like to ask you to talk talk a little bit more about uh, the impact of food in those uh, Nikkei's identities, because uh, as we saw in the lecture, the uh, uh, consumption of Brazilian and Japanese food is different from dif in so different social classes. And I'm wondering what's the influence or the impact of food in these two different Nikkei groups that you studied. Right, so I think there's, there's several uh, factors, factors for uh, people choosing like whether like Brazil and Japanese diet, but I also should uh, first go into that. I also should mention I'm talking the way, you know, just like framing Nikkei Brazilian people and whether it's, you know, do they eat like Japanese food or Brazilian food? But of course, they uh, eat like just more than like just Japanese and Brazilian food, right? So there's, of course, like kind of in middle place and then um, especially interviewees living in big cities where there's um, like food scene is like more vibrant and diverse. As I mentioned in the um, lecture, and then this is something I didn't know before uh, starting my project, but like Thai food and Vietnamese food, like such cuisines are not um, as common as uh, it is like um, in Brazil. 
And then um, in Brazil, like Mediterranean, like food is more common um, or like Arabian food, but that's not like something um, you see everywhere in Japan. So this like idea of like, you know, other than what you eat normally at home, then like, you know, something that you like to eat out uh, outside your home, the varieties that uh, they had was also different in Japan. And like some people just uh, had this mindset too of like, well, I'm in Japan, so like I don't need to eat Brazilian food every day. So like I just eat, you know, what I can eat. And then because I'm in Japan, like I should be eating Japanese food more, uh, things like that. And um, because some Brazilian ingredients are just, I think that most people like whether they're the Kasegi or middle class, they felt that just trying to cook Brazilian food and then like different equipments and then the prices. It's just like some people felt that there's like no need to just trying to like recreate like Brazilian food when there's um, in Japan, it's like just much more difficult to do it. Um, so the pricing and then the time, um, all that like factors like sorting um, in terms of whether like Japanese or like Brazilian food course i see yeah that's interesting i mean during during my when i when my stay in tokyo most of the like i said most of the brazilian restaurants that you see in big cities are just about barbecue uh, and which is not really a daily food for even for brazilians and to find what is more like brazilian daily food you need to go towards the concentrations of, of uh, Brazilian people, maybe Saitama, maybe uh, uh, Hamamasa, most of this, where, it's a, where, where the huge amount of Brazilians live in there. Uh, what do you think about this daily food of Brazil? Um, have you seen if Japanese Japanese people are consuming that or not, or are they popular not outside of the Japanese Brazilian community? You know, I think um, like just grilled meat and like shahasco in general, I think just, uh, you know, Brazilian style like uh, shahasco is like, I think definitely popular for Japanese people because they go so well with you know like Japanese beer and you know alcohol and then like you know party or just date or any sort of occasions and then face you know as as far as more like everyday food goes you know like feijons and then feijon feijoada um also like couple like a deep fried you know hot snacks like um you know the couple items that I introduced in the slide um like pastel I think it's, um, you know, if they're more like visible and available, like one item, you know, became popular in Japan is like ponde keijo, right? So I do think that there will be more like, you know, different uh, kind of Brazilian food boom like will happen in Japan again, just uh, um, I think Japanese people, you know, do not know them like right now very much. Uh, and then I also realized that from my interview, um, like Japanese Brazilian people, even if they get, you know, Brazilian food, they just think that uh, the seasoning, the saltiness is not as enough, you know, to their standard because in Brazil, uh, like the foods are like more salty, literally speaking. So the many, you know, restaurants kind of cater towards, you know, just like Japanese people is not enough for um, Nikkei Brazilian or Brazilian eaters like to get the, you know, their Brazilian food fix. So um, I think that's maybe like one thing um, difficult for like Japanese eaters to get used to the kind of like level of, you know, whether it's like fattiness or that, like some dishes heavy heaviness, whether it's, you know, feijoada or uh, some different foods. Um, but it can be like presented more, um, whether it's like um, in, in terms of presentations or um, maybe like 
substituting like some ingredients like to make it more familiar but yeah maybe like very like authentic brazilian food i'm not sure if it'll be like popular for um japanese people especially maybe older folks but um yeah i think the i yeah i'm looking forward to see like more like different like uh brazilian food booms that have been in japan because first it was shuhasco in 90s and then we haven't seen kind of like the brazil's turn in the gourmet scene so um it would be interesting to think about and then maybe newer nikkei brazilian generations um you know people might see uh business opportunities there too uh one thing I like that's from my field work, that one of the best pizza I ever had in my life was this uh, Brazilian pizza, <laughs> pizza Amamatsu. And it just not, it's not like, it's not like any pizza I ever had. And then uh, I still dream about it, <laughs> going back to that part of when I go back to Japan next time. It's uh, nice, yeah. And, 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 and I'm curious that you mentioned the Pony Keijo because I don't know who told me this story a few years, many years ago, I guess, that they, Pondi Keijo is, is very, um, I don't say popular, but every time we make Pondi Keijo in Japan, is a huge success. Everybody likes, everybody eats that. But they tried to sell Pondi Keijo, uh, and it didn't work at first, because Pondi Keijo, if you, if you, after you bake it, it takes a few time of, time a few maybe one hour later it's gonna be hard already and you cannot re reheat that so but you cannot start baking as the customer order then otherwise it's gonna take too long so uh i remember that they were there were kinds of complaints about this uh, uh the recipe itself because it was not flexible or uh for uh, for sale uh, and it, that's when I thought I, we never thought about it in Brazil because on the occasion it doesn't last long in the in any bakery and uh, and now you uh, and now you can have on the occasion 7-Eleven with Nori in the in the in the door and or like and in what, Brazil hmm? is it in Japan or Brazil that in Japan oh okay yeah, there's in Japan that the 7-Eleven selling pony keijo with, uh, I think they're calling cheese balls or something like that. And they have nori mixed it in the dough, which is very interesting. I mean, and the first time I, I had um, pony keijo with nori. Oh, really? <laughs> and I can how they can match well, though. Um, I would like to ask a question about did you i don't think did you include children in your in your research um or how if the those adults that you interview had children how does that work on on children so um because of my you know research ilb and stuff uh i couldn't specifically talk to uh you know young children but i did talk to uh people who have little children and then actually like having younger uh, children motivated parents to try to cook Brazilian food more often because what they eat, you know, at home or like what they get fed at the uh, uh, daycare or like, you know, elementary school is all Japanese. So I observed that uh, Nikkei Brazilian parents trying to incorporate like Brazilian food in their everyday life. but. Um, yeah, one interview he told me about because of the lack of exposure to Brazilian food and then, you know, liking Japanese food more, it became like hard for, you know, the parents to introduce kids to Brazilian food, like they have that, you know, rice and feijão, and then the, their kids' reaction is like, what is this, you know? Yeah. Um, but then um, also there is issue, you know, in both the other problem is that if you feed your children, you know, with Brazilian food at home, like exclusively, then like when they go uh, get like school lunch from elementary school, then like they have a hard time adjusting to uh, the change and then Japanese food. So I talked to somebody who actually work at school and it's sort of like 
mediate uh, issues with you know Brazilian students in the school. And among the common issues is like just uh, children couldn't students couldn't eat the um, school lunch provided from school. The worst case, like all what they could eat was like lice, and then that person's like job is like sort of come to the classroom and they explain, you know, oh, this dish is, you know, this and then that, you know, it's very good. Maybe you should try. But then, you know, like some, you know, children couldn't um, like just have it. So, you know, they try to talk to parents and then the parents are either like, okay, I'll try to talk. I'll, you know, talk and I try to cook um, Japanese food at home or, okay, I'll take them, take um, my kids to, um, you know, like family style restaurant and I'll try to order Japanese food. Um, so I know that there is that kind of like, you know, issues or like among like young uh, Nikkei Brazilian people, but also one thing, you know, another thing, you know, found in my interview is like, even though you might not uh, have like first, you know, good uh, your socialization with Japanese food, but you know, as you get older, you get exposed to different culture, different people. So I met interviewee who initially didn't like Japanese food, couldn't eat the Kyushoku school ranch, but then they, you know, later she had a boyfriend or like, you know, made a, made a friend and then gradually that, you know, sort of new, um, made new people open up their like uh, food varieties and food ways too. Interesting. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question that's from the YouTube chat. Um, Question is, if you saw any health outcome uh, in terms of physical and mental differences between the Dekasegi and the middle class, uh, like in terms of the food system? Mm, food system, health outcome. Yeah, I guess it's in, in, in if you, because there is this kind of health impacts between the daily uh, the eating habits of the Kasegi and the middle class. Uh, um, how does it, uh, you, did you see anything that really caught your attention in terms of physical or, or mental differences between these two groups of Nikkei? Mm, like physical wise, yeah, I think we, I talk about, you know, not having like enough energies because you mm. yeah, you can get like Brazilian food. And I think it can be very lonely too. Uh, like I had a picture from uh, Dr. Tsuda's like book, uh, Strangers in uh, Ethnic Homeland, that uh, Brazilian workers eat separate room or like kind of in a separate space from uh, Japanese workers. I heard a lot that even among like Nikkei Brazilian workers, doesn't mean like you're kind of like up and like, you know, chatting to each other. In today's age, uh, working in the factory, just people, like some people are just watching like YouTube during their uh, work break time or talking, uh, FaceTiming with their family and friends. So even during the, you know, lunch time, you're with like other, you know, coworkers, people just eat and it's just doing their own thing, right? So I think it's more uh, kind of, for some, you know, for like some people, it could be like lonely, like isolating experience because you're there in Japan, but you're not necessarily like making friends actually. And because of, you know, all social media and the ICT, it's nice that you can like connect to uh, your friends and family in Brazil. But uh, if you are someone, you know, trying to cultivate, you know, your social network in Japan, then like, I don't know, I think it could be sometimes lonely and challenging. Interesting. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I agree with you. I mean, I, I have, there is one in Brazil until a few years ago, there was this uh, program called Arubaito that it would, people were going to Japan to work like for two or three months only during the summer break in Brazil, just to get some money and, and, and and come back to Brazil. And mo most of the, the my friends who 
participating in, in this short short time jobs uh, they told us that they were not they never some of them never get got out of the city that they were living just they arrived from in, from the airport to there and then from there to the airport uh, and I think it's in, an interesting but maybe sad a different a different way to experience Japan experience living in Japan and working um, so I think it's um, interesting that when you if you are on the Kasegi and then you start decided to start living in Japan is it that just like the immigrants the Japanese immigrants in Brazil when they started to decided to stay in Brazil that's when they incorporated Japanese food uh, to their daily lives. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's probably right. Mm, so you think that change in the mindset mm -hmm. is has a lot of influence in, in the consumption of food? Right, because when you're like there for short term, like either you're kind of like oh i don't need to learn about you know different culture because i'm just only here or like you know sometimes that can motivate you know i'm only here for a shorter period of time so i want to eat you know food japanese food or food as much as so yeah just the uh, intentions of you know why the purpose that you're in a foreign country and like how long yeah that definitely i think also affect too interesting i'm very i'm curious about this uh um the relation of food with identity you know in a way that how the does the way uh, uh yourself in perceive you uh, uh, a person perceive themselves within the society changes as they change their eating habits do you have any any did you notice anything about that or did you have, do you have any additions to that because it's interesting for me that you have a mindset that you, you were in japan for a, a short period of time just to work but then suddenly you decide to stay in japan uh and your mindset changed that now we are not going back to brazil we're making a new life here in japan uh, which means that you can either, you can both spend more money to your daily life and you probably also need to uh, incorporate other aspects of Japanese culture to get inside the, the, the Japanese society itself. So do you have any comments on, on this change of mindsets? and the, the relation to food yeah i think other notion that's you know very specific to nikki brazilian people is this idea of saudaji right mm. like this kind of you know like wronging but you know more like kind of melancholic tone that so it's like strong like you know emotive, emotive you know kind of it's almost like nostalgia but uh you know, in a little bit more like a sad way. So for these people who don't know, like when they eventually like they can get settled, settled in Brazil, it's like eating Brazilian food is like in Japan is like good. It's like good that uh, they became more accessible and stuff. But also it is kind of the reminder that they are not at home. They are not in Brazil because it's not like actual like Brazilian food that they're used to, right? So I thought that was uh, very like interesting to, um, and it's just how far, you know, Brazil is, you know, from Japan, right? And then again, like kind of kicking like economic, you know, capital, like when like you can afford to go back, you know, how often. Um, so yeah, just, you know, like how you've, how far you feel about you know your home and it just uh, also uh shahasko so people miss you know people might people talk about 
it's not the food that they you know miss it's not that like pieces of you know like picanha or something that they're really missing it's about you know that you miss this kind of like a space that you share this food with their like families and like friends right so you might be able to do shahasko in japan you know down around the river or like wherever but the, this kind of you know family like intimate you know the space that everybody you know spoken like a portuguese or you know different language that that's something like they will have a hard time to recreate right so uh, maybe like that's why um uh, I think somebody asked about, you know, how it was like a future of, you know, Nikkei Brazilian community and their food. But I think that, you know, some uh, like factory towns like Nikkei Brazilian communities will probably, you know, like uh, stay as, you know, they are like currently. And then that community, you know, is like still important for these, uh, you know, people like who might not be able to return to Japan or, you know, might not have their family living there anymore, but they have, they found this like a new family, um, Nikkei Brazilian community in Japan that they can kind of uh, lean back, lean back on. So um, yeah, like, you know, food is definitely like emotional thing too. And then um, I think like for in Brazil, like, food is very like so social oriented, um, social beauty oriented. And then I also find that people more inviting, like you don't need to be like a really close friend or family to be invited for like dinner or like birthday parties. So if I think like for people living in cities, that aspect is like another uh, challenging part too. But I also think that um, for I think in, in Japan, like people say, oh, apartment is like too small, you know, to host, you know, people. I think um, Nikkei Brazilian people, like some people I interviewed, they're like, yeah, my space is like small, but come over. So, you know, they just, doesn't matter whether you're living like a house or apartment. Um, if you have this kind of, you know, hospitality, same hospitality that you had from home, like you can recreate the same like social space again. I see. Yeah, and that's interesting. And kind of even my own my own house and my family was just like that. I mean, sometimes some uh, some friends would just come over without telling and without being invited. They just knock the door and say, Oh hey, how are you? And just go inside, order a pizza or, or make something for lunch or dinner. Uh, and that's very common. I mean that that's something we are used to and and like I said, I mean, when, when you are in a different continent, different culture, um, sometimes you cannot uh, um, just have these cultural habits that you are used to. And it's interesting that you mentioned the churrasco and then that, that nostalgia feeling, because when I was in Japan last year, uh, I went for a barbecue with Brazilian friends, and some of these friends are married to... Uh, Japanese women, and we had a great night uh, uh, eating churrasco, eating churrasco and talking and laughing. But then when you were leave, we were leaving, one of those Brazilian guys was saying that you know what, everything was good, but I really missed onigiri. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, that was what I was missing too. And his wife was like, why? <laughs> Why are you guys talking about onigiri? Which onigiri? And this shonigiri, simple onigiri. And she started laughing, like, "Why? Because that's what we eat in with churrasco in Brazil." So even even we could create this atmosphere or this uh, environment that uh, uh, kind of remembers our our lifestyle in Brazil, but. I don't know, I guess it's just sometimes you just forget. And uh, you only notice when you miss it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, should we uh, tackle with like other YouTube chat question? They're all like great comparing question. Um, any of them like you'd like to answer, Eric? Um, me? Do you want, um, you can choose one. I mean, 
Let me see. Oh, I like this one about authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I hate the word authentic when we talk about food, but um, do among your interviews, they, did they say anything about just like those plate lunches or plato fetus that were selling in Brazil? Uh, did they say anything about that really being a nostalgia from home, or like a flavor from home, or is was just more like something that we have that's very close? Yeah, like something I think that a uh, lot of one, you know, something very close, but um, again. Brazilian who is available in cities, especially or more um, seasoned, like, you know, thinking Japanese eaters or international eaters in mind, right? So, and then I know that some like franchised, uh, you know, Shahasko restaurants, you know, they don't necessarily make everything in kitchen, you know what I mean? So I think uh, that kind of, you know, Yes, you know, I think like some foods, you know, you can maybe go wrong, maybe like Ponde Queijo, but like Feijong or, you know, some people have like very, right, like a specific, you know, expectation. Uh, so I think that sort of food may be uh, at the, uh, you know, kind of Shihasko style, more like generic, you know, Brazilian food restaurants, uh, they might not be able to. But also, you know, other thing I thought was interesting is that for interview, like, you know, Nikkei Brazilian people live in Japan for, you know, kind of like, longer than they live in Brazil or like, you know, for over like five, 10 years, they start getting to like Japanese taste. So when they have like Brazilian food, like when they go back home, they'll be like, oh, it's like too salty, like too oily or like, you know, too like sweet. So they now like, uh, their like taste like became more close to, uh, because, you know, like Japanese food because of uh, how long they live. And then it's not that they become like dislike, but that kind of also reflect, you know. Uh, so like some people, uh, some Nikkei Brazilian people might go like, you know, Shahasko or like, you know, Japanese people own like Brazilian restaurants. They might say, yeah, it's like perfect for me. So it's so also, yeah, like the, yeah, I agree with you. This like authenticity is like very like tricky, like interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, I saw another interesting question because that uh, when, when Japanese went to Brazil, they immigrated to Brazil, they created this Nikkei menu of eating habits and Japanese rice style miso soup with Feijão, uh, grilled meat, and 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 salads. Um, do you believe that the those Nikkeis, when they return to Japan, they are transforming this Nikkei uh, style that they brought from Brazil? They are readapting that somehow into a different style. And can this style go back to Brazil? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point, too. I mean, yeah, like, I do wonder, you know, when they, like, return to Japan, do they bring back, like, some of, like, Japanese-style taste or, like, cooking? Um, yeah, like, I, that's, you know, like, unfortunately, I, I wish I visited, like, Brazil and I knew more about, like, you know, Japanese food, like, trend there. Um, but like, do you think like when you return to like, you know, Brazil and then, you know, when you meet with your family and friends, are you bringing like some kind of like a new wave, like, you know, introducing something new that you, uh, learn like, you know, from Japan in terms of like food and then like cooking? Um, I guess not, not major transformations, but we can make some uh, um, different changes. So, for example, before going to Japan for the first time, or even when I came back, uh, the curry rice recipe from my family was the basic, carrots, onion, potatoes, and meat. But at some time, I started watching a lot of uh, food program, TV food programs in Japan. And I kind of started to think about different ingredients to put there. So, now, uh, uh, my 
my family recipe for curry rice has eggplant on that. Eggplant? And, yeah. And my mom complains a lot when I when we don't <laughs> if we forget the eggplant. So I think that yes, you can you can make some changes or even I guess maybe even even Japan they are experiencing uh, with new combinations of, of ingredients. And then when you come back, you go you travel to Japan, you, you taste that and you like it. And if when you come back, that's a different way to prepare. And then if you have access to the ingredients, I mean, why not? Right. So I, I do think that that it's not gonna make, I don't think at this point it's not gonna make a major change. But yeah, and it all depends on on where this People go after the return from Japan. Well, and probably when you come to Japan, I think, you know, some, so, um, yeah, like, what was the question? Sorry, somebody asked about, yeah, like a culture shock uh, when exposed to real Japanese food. And then, uh, so, yeah, one is like, you know, about like sweet flavor. And then, uh, yeah, just they you also get exposed to more like a different kind of you know regional Japanese food that might not be you know common or available in Brazil too, right? So like you maybe like so, or some people might have a new understanding about like Japanese food, and then some of them might have a new you know favorites you know that's from like Hokkaido or uh, Osaka. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And the interpretation of Japanese food around, I mean, e even in, in, uh, inside Japan, I guess, um, is kind of different and, and, and it changes the way you, the way you are introduced to food sometimes. I mean, one, one thing that we always say to Brazilians when they go to, I always ask this question, I heard someone that, from Brazil is going to Japan for the first time, I always ask, what do you want to eat there? What's the first thing they want to eat? And I heard a lot of people saying temaki or yakisoba. And I say, ah, that's not going to be easy <laughs> to find. I mean, of course, the temaki exists and the yakisoba exists, but it's not like in everywhere. Yakisoba, yakisoba is mostly like a, a summer festival or festival food. There are not many restaurants that sell yakisoba. Um, well, there are, but um, but temaki is more complicated because I think it's just like home food, mm -hmm. especially if you compare to the Brazilian food temaki that was transformed into like a fast food that you can find temaki like everywhere mm -hmm. in Brazil, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's interesting how. The notion that they have of Japanese food here is will be completely different from what they find in Japan, mm -hmm. and yeah, that that's a big impact in in someone moving to Japan to work on on a budget. Mm -hmm. See. So to. Does I have another question for you? Um, what do you think about, or how is going to be the next generation of? We talk about we will talk a little bit about children already, but how do you think is going to be this uh, uh, children or children the next generation of? Uh, Dekaseis or Nikkeis in Brazil, in Japan. Do they have? Do you think they will have more acceptance of Japanese food or? Yeah, I think so. And then, uh, sorry, it's not like necessary food, but um, I think Nisei is like second generation, like maybe even some Sansei, third generation people had this kind of identity conflict always, right? When you're in Brazil, you're not in Brazil, you're not Brazilian enough. And then when you're in Japan, you're not like Japanese enough. And then so like who am I type of, you know, 
identity conflict that has been you know discussed in academic literature for a while but i think like some people realizing and are getting more comfortable with the idea of oh like i'm just you know part brazilian and part japanese and like that's enough you know i don't you know need to be 100 percent of either or so this uh more future generations are kind of getting more comfortable with the uh, identity journey and like some people like actually thinking like you know oh like i'm actually like cool because like i'm i can like speak both japanese or portuguese so i understand like both cultures and people find you know maybe new opportunities like from that too you know sort of like uh by you know um yeah like how being like half japanese uh half brazilian whether it's you know about like food or like a different industry but like just having that you know like great understanding of like both cultures and languages like people actually like find the opportunities in like entrepreneurship or uh yeah like just because now the society is like more uh you know we're in a society like we are trying to be you know, understanding and then just uh, not like imposing expectations to, you know, people from that sort of background. So uh, I think there's like more exciting, you know, time like for like, Brazilian people in that sense. But uh, yeah, what would you think, Eric? Mm, I think that the, the, the new generation, I think they tend to grow up uh, in more contact with uh both cultures like i said i see one of um, i see some children of, of of my friends in brazil in japan and they are already navigating through both languages um one, one of my my friend's daughter she speaks only portuguese with him and only japanese with his mother her mother and she's a brazilian as well so and and she kind of learned how to the, there are these two cultures in parallel uh, on, on her life that she is studying Japanese and eating in Japanese food at school. But if uh, sometimes at home is not, it is will be Brazilian food. So I think they 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 will be able to navigate through this uh, uh, acceptance or incorporation of eating habits and cultures. And um, perhaps just like Japanese immigrants, when they, they their children were more adapted to to the Brazilian society, and I think it would be the same for uh, children of different cities. Yeah, great, great point. Thank you both so much. Um, before we started the lecture, um, Eric told us a really great story about using a rice cooker um, in Japan. Could you share that story with everyone? <laughs> no, I can. Yeah. The first time I went to Japan, I was uh, I was afraid of missing Brazilian food, and I brought a bag of beans to cook in Japan, but I completely forgot that cooking beans require a pressure cook, which I could not find at that time. And my lack of experience in cooking feijão also uh, did not remind me to soak in water to get a little bit softer. Because I had, I heard from one of my colleagues that I could use a rice cooker to cook beans. And the way he told me was just like, put the beans inside, put water, close it, push the button. When it's done, you open and check if if you need more water, put more water, press the button and go through the cycle until it's done. It took me like three hours and a half to have something like a peanut. That's not really feijão, but I was so hungry that time that, you know what, let's have this for lunch and never try to do feijão in the rice cooker again. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that story. <laughs> and thank you both so much for joining us. And thank you everyone in the YouTube for joining us. Um, this is all the time that we have for tonight. 
Um, as a reminder, if you're a PhD student or a scholar who's interested in traveling to Japan for research, I hope you'll follow the links below to learn more about our Adapting Cities Fellowship programs. Um, and you can also watch interviews with more of our former fellows right here on our YouTube channel. So thank you again so much for joining us today and stay tuned for more lectures. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies for not being able to uh, answer like all questions, uh, but my email is uh, lumika at markhawaii.edu. Uh, you can maybe Google too, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm very thankful for Japan Foundation for organizing this movie. Uh, you're amazing. And then uh, Eric just yeah, I, I, I'm grateful that you're here tonight. I uh, could ask for a better moderator for this uh, lecture tonight. So, and thank you. The, um, yeah, thank you so much for all great questions. And then grateful for this uh, engaging audiences tonight. I know it's very late in East Coast so and Friday night. So thank you for tuning in. Yeah, and thank you, Rumiko, for the invitation. Thank you, the Japan Foundation, for all support.